All right, everyone, thank you for coming back for the second talk of the Vantage seminar today. This is our second talk in the series about modular curves and Gawa representations. And for this talk, we're happy to have Lori Watson speaking about odd degree isolated points on X1 of N with rational J invariant. Um, and Lori, is it all right if we video this talk? Yes. Oh, great. Well, please go ahead. So first, uh, thank you to Drew and Rachel for organizing this seminar. And thank you, of course, for the invitation to speak. And thank you to everyone who's taking the time to give me a chance to share some of my recent work with you. Um, and this talk is based on joint work with Abby Burdon, David Argill, and Jeremy Rouse. And for the first part of the talk, my goal is to just explain what isolated points are because the notion of an isolated point applies to curves outside of X1 of N. And then midway through the talk, we'll switch our focus to the modular curves X1 of N in particular. So the question of when a curve can have infinitely many rational points was of course answered in Faulting's celebrated theorem. And his theorem says, that if you have a number field K, then any curve of genus at least two has only finitely many K rational points. And so in particular, if you're given a curve over Q, then we know that C of Q can be inf infinite only if the genus is either zero or one. And we know that both of those cases happen. So for a genus zero curve like P1, if it has even one rational point, then it will have infinitely many. For a genus one curve, if it has a rational point, then it's an elliptic curve. And to say that it has infinitely many Q rational points just means that you're dealing with a positive rank elliptic curve and those are known to exist over Q. And that behavior is unchanged if you consider an arbitrary number field instead of just Q. And I'm going to talk a lot about degrees of points. And so I'll start here with the definition by the degree of a closed point, I just mean the degree of the extension that you get when you would join that point. So as an example, if I have the curve C defined here by y squared equals x to the fifth plus x squared plus one, then I have a closed point given by the Galois orbit of the point one square root of three and one minus square root of three. And I consider this a degree two point over the rational numbers because in order to realize this point, we have to be working over the quadratic extension, Q adjoin the square root of three. So in order to see this point, we have to make a quadratic extension. So we'll consider this a degree two point over Q. And so in the language of degrees of points, what Faulting's theorem tells us is that for any curve of genus at least two and any number field K, the set of degree one points is always going to be finite. But that can change when you allow the degree to be something greater than one. So we'll return to that last curve C. Again, it's defined by Y squared equals X to the fifth plus X squared plus one. This is a curve of genus two. So we only have finitely many rational points, finitely many degree one points. And if we fix a rational number A and allow A to serve as the X coordinate of this point, then we'll get a point uh, over any field that contains the square root of A squared plus uh, A to the fifth plus A squared plus one. And I'll denote such a field by case of A. Now, by Faulting's theorem, for any given case of A, I'll still only have finitely many Ka rational points. But if we allow A to run through the rational numbers, then for most values of A, A to the fifth plus A squared plus one won't be a square. So we'll get an honest to goodness degree two extension of the rational numbers. And in that way, we can obtain infinitely many degree two closed points on this curve C. So again, it has genus one, it can hold only have finitely many degree one points over Q, but as soon as I allow myself to consider degree two points, then we have infinitely many rash, uh, degree two points over uh, on this curve C. And what's really making all of this work is that we have a degree two morphism from the curve to P1. So in, uh, so in other words, what we have is a hyperelliptic curve. And in this case, our morphism is defined by just sending a point with coordinates x, y to x, 
and our infinitely many degree two points on our curve C are really coming from the infinitely many degree one points on the genus zero curve P1. And there was nothing special about two in this case. If we have a degree demorphism from C to P1, then there will be infinitely many degree one points on P1 that give rise to infinitely many degree D points of C. And this is a consequence of Hilbert's irreducibility theorem. As long as I have a dominant degree D map from the curve C to P1, we can expect there to be infinitely many degree D points. So that's one way that we can hope to find infinitely many degree D points. But gene of zero curves aren't the only curves that can have infinitely many rational points. So for example, maybe I don't quite have a degree D map to P1, but maybe instead we have a degree D map to an elliptic curve, like in the second example. So for this example, I'm gonna let C, it's again a hyperelliptic curve, but this time it's defined by Y squared equals X to the ninth plus X cubed plus one. And just like before, it admits a degree two morphism to P1, so we would still expect to see infinitely many degree two points on this curve. But this curve also admits a degree three map to the elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed plus x plus one. And in this case, you send a point on C with coordinates x comma y to a point on your elliptic curve with coordinates x cubed comma y. This tells us that we can expect there to be cubic points whenever we have some rational point AB on the elliptic curve. And since I've sort of rigged the game so that I have an elliptic curve with positive rank, there will be infinitely many such cubic points. Okay, so we have a second example where we're getting infinitely many degree D points parameterized by P1 or a positive rank elliptic curve. And you might wonder, are those the only ways in which this, these things can happen? And not quite. Um, to give a sense of the more general way that you can get infinitely many degree D points, I'll point you to these examples of Debar and Felois. They provided examples of curves that did admit, admit infinitely many degree D points, despite not having any maps of degree less than or equal to D to P1 or to an elliptic curve. And their construction instead involved the deep symmetric product, which we saw in Aiken's talk a little while ago. So for this, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to assume that I'm dealing with a curve over a number field K, and I'm assuming that it has at least one K rational point. A closed point of degree D on this curve C gives rise to a K rational point on the deep symmetric product, and there's a natural map from the deep symmetric product to the Jacobian of the curve. So if this map isn't injective, then we can conclude that there's a dominant morphism from the curve C to P1 of degree D. And as before, we'll have infinitely many degree D points. But what if this map actually is injective? Is it still possible that you can get degree D points from this map? And the answer is yes, under the right conditions. So if the degree D map from the D, if the natural map from the deep symmetric product to the Jacobian is not injective, then by Faulting's theorem, uh, Faulting's theorem implies that there are finitely many K rational abelian subvarieties of the Jacobian and finitely many K rational points such that the image of the deep symmetric product is equal to the union of these translates of these abelian subvarieties. And so in this situation, if you hope to have infinitely many degree D points, it's necessary that one of these A sub I's will have positive rank. And that really does capture the true story about when you can have infinitely many degree D closed points. So if you have a number field K and you have a curve C, in order to have infinitely many degree D closed points, one of two things like we've seen has to happen. Either the curve C admits a dominant map of degree D to P1, or it's more like the Debar and Felois examples where the set of degree D points of C inject into the set of K rational points of some translate of a positive rank abelian subvariety of the Jacobian of the curve. But even when you have infinitely many degree D points, that doesn't mean that those two constructions really tell you the whole story of degree D points. So as a third example, I have this curve here. It's another hyperelliptic curve. You can tell that I like those. This is a hyperelliptic curve defined by y squared equals this eight degree polynomial that I'm calling f of x. Again, it's hyperelliptic. We still expect it to have infinitely many quadratic points. And most of these are going to be of the form a comma plus or minus the square root of f of a, where a is some rational number, but there's at least one point that does not arise in this fashion. 
you can check that the point i plus or minus 4i is a quadratic point of this curve. It's certainly quadratic because we have to be working over the field that contains the square root of negative one in order to realize this point. But it's definitely not like these other examples because, for example, the x coordinate isn't rational. And so it's not coming from the sort of natural map where you send a point x, y on the curve to x on p1. But you might be wondering, well, is it possible that there's another degree to morphism to P1? And the answer is no, because for hyperelliptic curves of genus at least two, there is a unique degree two map to P1. So this isn't explained by the dominant map that I have to P1, but maybe it's explained by something having to do with the Jacobian. The answer is still no. It's not part of an infinite family of quadratic points of um, an abelian subvariety of the Jacobian. And we know this because the Jacobian of this curve has rank zero over Q. So we have here a point that even though it's lying in a degree where there are infinitely many other points of that same degree, it's somehow not explained by the construction from which you can get infinitely many degree D points. And this leads us to the definition of an isolated point. So if we have a curve C defined over a number field K and we have a closed point of degree D, we say that that point is isolated if it doesn't belong to an infinite family of degree D points parameterized either by P1 or by a translate of a positive rank abelian subvariety of the curves Jacobian. And this term isolated points was first defined in a paper of Burdon, Ejdar, Lu, Otomoto, and Varai, and their focus was on modular curves, but I should note that isolated points, even though they weren't given that, um, that term, they were identified earlier than that. Okay, so these are not new kinds of points, it's just that the term is relatively new. And one of the things that they showed is that in order to have infinitely many degree D points on a curve C, there has to be at least one degree D point that's not isolated. But there's one type of point that's guaranteed to be isolated. So as a reminder, in order to be um, in order to be isolated, we have to say that it's not part of an infinite family of points parameterized either by P1 or something having to do with an abelian subvariety of the Jacobian. But if you already know, for example, that there just are not infinitely many points in that degree at all, or even stronger that there are only finitely many points of degree less than or equal to D, then any point in degree D is going to be isolated. And we call such a point sporadic. So definition, if C is a curve defined over a number field K, then we say that a closed point X is sporadic if there are only finitely many other closed points with degree less than or equal to the degree of X. And some of the first isolated points on modular, curve that on modular curves that people found were actually sporadic points. Okay, and so now I'll start talking about modular curves. Just as a reminder, if I fix a positive integer n and I refer to the modular curve x1 of n, then I'm talking about an algebraic curve that can be defined over the rational numbers. And the k rational non cuspidal points on such a curve correspond up to isomorphism to a pair of an elliptic curve and a distinguished point of order n defined over the field k. And because I'm also going to talk in at points about x naught of n, let me remind you what the non cuspidal k rational points on x naught of n correspond to. The non-cuspidal k-rational points there correspond up to isomorphism to a pair of an elliptic curve and a cyclic subgroup of order n or equivalently an elliptic curve E and a k-rational cyclic isogeny. So sporadic points. Again, some of the first sporadic points that were identified, or some of the first, first isolated points on modular curves that were identified were in fact sporadic points. And these points were actually not terribly surprising. For example, you might expect CM points to give rise naturally to sporadic points. And this is because if you have a CM elliptic curve with a CM by an imaginary quadratic field K, then you can get isogenies in very low degree as long as you're working over that imaginary quadratic field K. And as you might imagine, once you get those isogenies in low degree, it's maybe not too unreasonable to expect that you'll also get torsion points in relatively low degree. And so work of Clark, Cook, and Stankiewicz shows that you'll get CM isolated points on X1 of L for sufficiently large primes L. Sorry, I said isolated. I really mean sporadic, so something even stronger. 
right? So for all sufficiently large primes L, you can find CM sporadic points. And I believe Drew actually gave an argument that extended this to composite N and more recently work of Clark, Janow, Pollock and Saya also extends this kind of result to, uh, to composite N for arbitrarily large N, okay? So CM sporadic points are really not terribly surprising, but there were other examples of sporadic points that were a bit more surprising. So for example, Mark Van Hoy found a point of degree six on X1 of 37. And for those of you who are a little bit familiar with ganality, the ganality of that curve is 18. And so to have a point in degree six, it's so far below the ganality that it has to be sporadic. And here, uh, um, Philip Nyman found a point of degree three on the curve X1 of 21. And that example is especially interesting because the point that he found on X1 of 21, it corresponds to an elliptic curve that actually has rational J invariant and that attains a point of order 21 over the maximal real sub, uh, cyclic, sorry, the maximal real subfield of the ninth cyclotomic field. Okay, so I'm not saying that like the, um, that necessarily the elliptic curve has rational coefficients. Although in this case, I believe that this is a very special example because I think actually you can choose a model that has rational coefficients. But in general, even if the uh, J invariant is rational, that's not necessarily saying that the elliptic curve that realizes uh, your point of order in is also going to have rational coefficients. Okay, so for a fixed curve C, there are only finitely many isolated points of any given degree D. And once the degree is large enough, then no point of degree D can be isolated. And if you put those two facts together, that means that for any given curve, there can only be finitely many isolated points at all. And so in particular, if you fix a positive integer N, there can only be finitely many isolated points on X1 of N. But as we saw in that result from Clark, Cook, and Stankiewicz, the set of isolated points, if you allow yourself to range over all positive integers in, is actually an infinite set. And there are even CM elliptic curves with rational J invariant that give, iso that give rise to isolated points of arbitrarily large degree. Right? So even if you just say, well, let's only consider the isolated points corresponding to elliptic curves with rational J invariant, we're still dealing with an infinite set. A set that we actually believe to be finite though, is the set of J invariants themselves. In other words, it's expected that only finitely many rational J invariants can correspond to isolated points on X1 of N. And this is one of the main theorems in that paper by Bourdon, Ejdar, Liu, Otomodu, and Barai. If you let I denote the set of all isolated points of modular curves, on X1 of N as you range through all positive integers N. And if you assume Serre's uniformity conjecture, then the set of rational J invariants that give rise to isolated points on modular curve is finite. So what this result is saying is that if you allow, if you assume Serre's uniformity conjecture, then even though we know there are infinitely many isolated points on modular curves that correspond to elliptic curves with rational J invariant, only finitely many J invariants are actually accounting for that infinite set of isolated points. And as a brief reminder, Serre's uniformity conjecture, it was originally a question posed by Serre, but I think formally conjectured by Sutherland and Zwina. And it says that there exists a constant M such that for all non-CM elliptic curves, E over Q, and for all primes of uh, all sufficiently large primes, the mod P Galois representation is surjective. And the expectation is that you should be able to take M to be 37. And so if that result is true, if that conjecture is true, then we'll know that even though we have infinitely many isolated points corresponding to, to elliptic curves of rational J invariant, only finitely many J invariants are actually giving rise to those examples. What Abby, David, Jeremy, and I were interested in was trying to find some sort of unconditional result along the same lines. And what we were able to show is that if you just add in one, not small, but one assumption, namely that the degree of the isolated point is odd, then you actually can get an unconditional result. So at the expense of 
putting this restriction on the degree of your isolated point, you get something that no longer relies on Sayre's uniformity conjecture. And so what we show is that if you let I sub odd denote the set of, odd, of isolated points of odd degree on all modular curves where you again range through all positive integers, then the set of rational J invariants that correspond to odd degree isolated points is one of only possibly five J invariants. On the left-hand side, we have two non-CMJ invariants. And on the right-hand side, we have three CMJ invariants. And we know that the two non-CMJ invariants actually occur. And if you're paying close attention to Naimon's example, this CMJ invariant here, the first one in the list on the left-hand side, sorry, non-CMJ invariant, this is the one corresponding to Philip Naimon's example of a sporadic point of degree three on X1 of 21. Okay, and where do we get all of this mileage just by assuming that the degree is odd? Well, really the key thing is that it allows us to exploit this connection that we have then between a, an odd degree point on X1 of N and rational cyclic isogenies. What we show is that if you have a point of odd degree on X1 of N, then as long as you stay away from one exceptional J invariant, you can say something about primes P that have to divide N and you can also say, that, so for example, the prime P has to be one that appears in this list here. And moreover, what you can say is that the J invariant of that point is going to be equal to the J invariant of some rational elliptic curve that has a cyclic P isogeny over Q. And even more, we can tell you something about what the shape of N looks like. So for example, you couldn't take all of these primes and multiply them together and get some horrendously large thing. Instead, N has to look like two to the A times B to the P, sorry, P to the B times Q to the C. And we even have some control over what A is. So this puts lots of restrictions on the kinds of points that can arise on modular, uh, odd degree, mod, sorry, odd, odd degree points that can arise, arise on modular curves. Okay. In the paper, we end up having to treat CM and non-CM points mostly separately, but there's one result that gets used again and again throughout the paper. And it says that if you have a finite map of curves and you have some isolated point on a curve C, then you can push that isolated point on C down to an isolated point on the curve D, as long as you have the maximal possible, possible degree growth on residue fields. So if the degree growth from X to F of X is as large as possible, then an isolated point gets pushed down to an isolated point. And one of the results that allows us to exploit that is a result of Greenberg and Greenberg, Rubin, Silverberg, and Stoll. Um, but the goal of, of, so with that, that last result in mind, it gives us one approach for identifying isolated points on X1 of N. So as you can imagine, trying to do computations on X1 of N can be really hard, especially as N gets large. But what that theorem allows us to do is in some cases, look at the natural map from X1 of N to X1 of M for some M that divides N. And then your hope is that you can sort of push things down to some level where you can better understand what's going on. And this result of Greenberg and Greenberg, Rubin, Silverberg, and Stoll is about images of piatic Galois representations for elliptic curves that have cyclic P isogenies. And what the result does is it gives us a chance to determine some nice values of M for which that necessary condition on the growth of uh, the residue fields is going to hold. And what that result is really about is what it tells us is that the image of a piatic Galois representation is somehow as large as possible. And by that, I mean, as large as the cyclic P isogeny will allow for. And an example of how this gets used, in order to show that you have no non-CM isolated points of odd degree on X1 of two times seven to the B with a rational J invariant, what we do is we show that any such odd degree isolated point would actually have to map down to a non-cuspidal isolated point on X1 of 14. But X1 of 14 has no non-cuspidal Q rational points. And so if we're dealing with a point that has odd degree, the degree has to be at least three. But X1 of 14 is an elliptic curve. So it has genus one, which means that nothing in degree three can actually be isolated. We use lots of techniques in this paper for trying to address different N. 
And in general, the approach is to just, again, try to push an isolated point on x1 of n down to some isolated point on another curve. Often the hope is that you can push it all the way down to something that has such low genus that maybe no isolated points can exist. For example, if you take an isolated, a potentially isolated point and you push it all the way down to a genus zero curve, then you're done because genus zero curves don't have isolated points. Or barring that, maybe you can push it down to some lower genus curve where the genus is at least small enough so that we can perform the sorts of computations that will allow us to answer the question. But as you can imagine, primes like two and three sometimes throw a wrench into things. And so that nice technique of just push things down doesn't always work as easily as it did in the um, x1 of two times seven to the b example. Um, for example, to deal with curves for uh, x1 of two to the a times three to the b, what we first had to show was that an isolated point of odd degree corresponding to a non-zium elliptic curve with rational J invariant on one of these curves would actually have to map down to an isolated point on either x1 of 54 or x1 of 162, but you're still dealing with powers in two and three, so it's still a little bit difficult. And so in order to show that these curves had no non-CM isolated points of odd degree, we had to use things like a three-adic classification that's in progress work of Rouse, Sutherland, and Zurich Brown. But we also, at some point, especially when dealing with X1 of 54, we had to really deal with something known as entanglement. So we had to um, fi explicitly find all of the rational points on a genus four curve that was really characterizing the possible entanglement of uh, an elliptic curve or elliptic curves defined over the rational numbers. Okay, so for um, a product of a power of two and a power of three, again, as you can imagine, things get a little bit complicated. And that captures a lot of the kinds of things that we had to do for non-CM J invariants. And for CM J invariants, well, as a reminder, if an elliptic curve over Q has CM by an order O, then the discriminant of that order can be one of only 13 integers. So we really only have a finite list of things that we have to check. And we show that there are no isolated points of odd degree with rational J invariant corresponding to an elliptic curve um, by order of 10 of those discriminants. Uh, but for the remaining three discriminants, negative 43, negative 67, negative 163, uh, those actually correspond to the three J invariants that appeared in the main theorem. And so you might be wondering, okay, what's the obstruction there? Well, in order to complete the classification of odd degree isolated points, we have to determine whether or not there are points of degree 21, 33, and 81 on X1 of 43, X1 of 67, and X1 of 163 respectively that are isolated. And the difficulty lies in the fact that the Jacobians of each of these curves have positive rank. And so it's really a computational thing that's standing in the way of a complete classification of the odd degree isolated points that correspond to rational J invariants. And so to end, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the remaining problems and questions that sort of naturally arise. So that result of Bourdon, Edgestar, Lou, Otomoto, and Barai says that once we know Sayre's uniformity conjecture, or if we know that it's true, then we'll get an unconditional result that applies to even and odd degree. But until we have such a result, is there any other way of getting some unconditional results for isolated points of even degree? That's one natural question. Um, another question, so CMJ invariants, as I said, they're a natural class of uh, sporadic points on, they give you a natural class of sporadic points on modular curves. And actually for many CMJ invariants, you can find um, a point on a modular curve that's in such low degree that if you sort of allow yourself to go up a tower and keep lifting to points on other on higher and higher modular curves, they're all occurring in such low degree that they still have to be sporadic points on those modular curves. But that's something that seems so far to be special to CM. So one question is, is there a non-CMJ invariant that will also give rise to similar behavior? Is there some non-CMJ invariant for which you can always provably show that if you go up and up and up a tower, that same J invariant is always giving rise to isolated or is often giving rise to isolated points on um, X1 of N for larger and larger N. And finally, what's the proportion of non-CM to CM isolated J invariants? 
So in our list, we have two non-CMJ invariants that definitely occur and three CMJ invariants that might occur, but what's the proportion overall? So we know that you can have both non-CM and CM isolated J invariants. Like if you ask me, I would say it's probably the case that most of them are coming from CM points, but what's the proportion overall? And there's one other question that I've often been asked, and so I'll just acknowledge it here. Um, a few times people have asked me, what about X not of N? And that's a great question. And Zonia Menendez, a student at Wesleyan, is currently working on X not of N. So it's in progress, but it's not my question, so that's why it's not included in this list. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, so this would be a great time for questions. Um, I can ask a question. Yes. So um, one of the examples that you gave, uh, you were looking at the modular curves x1 of 2 times 7 to the b, I think. Yes. And then you said that um, you lower the isolated points on that modular curve to x1 of 14. So how do you get rid of the power b? Do you show that uh, that curve has some 7 isogeny? or? Yeah, it's really leveraging that result of Greenberg, Rubin, Silverberg, and Stoll to say that um, for high enough powers, yeah, you sort of have to have a seven isogeny that's telling you that um, you would have the maximal residue field growth that you would have to have in order to push things down as far as you can push them down. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm kind of curious about these three CMJ invariants that you don't know whether they're isolated or not. So you, you know that you have, you know, points of these degrees, right? And that, but then the problem, as you said, is that in order to figure out whether they're isolated, you need to figure out whether they lie in this like family of rational points parameterized by a positive rank abelian subvariety. So it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of ironic because you're trying, it sounds like a question about CM points, but the answer has to do with, you know, all these other points. Is there any, do you have any intuition or any, any feelings about like what the, what the answer would be? Honestly, no, if you handed me a random CM point and said, what are you, like, what are your odds on the degree? I'm going to say it's probably even, but that's a slightly different question than what you're asking. And I would be surprised if none of them gave rise to isolated J invariants. I think it would be interesting and strange if the only odd degree isolated J invariants were all from non-CM elliptic curves. Mm -hmm. um, but as to which of them might actually give, uh, give you an isolated odd degree, uh, uh, sorry, an odd degree isolated point, I don't know that I, I would put money down on any one of them. I mean, to me, I think it's it's a very interesting question because like, as I understand it, the philosophy behind these isolated versus non-isolated points is we're trying to, you know, kind of um, qualitatively understand, you know, infinite families of points, um, you know, on, on curves. And we're trying to understand, you know, how, why do we have this point, you know, this low degree? And because it's a CM point, we already have a complete, you know, we have, we have a different kind of understanding. Uh, for the uh, for and for the idea of the Okay. Um, for in the CM, we have like a totally CM explanation for why we have this point of a low degree. I mean, you know, we know all we know lots of stuff about degrees of, of CM points, but then you know, because you have this definition of isolated in order to figure out whether it's isolated or not, you need to figure out whether it occurs in this like other 
you know, geometric family of points. And, and it's just like, so do you, do you expect that this CM point occurs in this interesting non-trivial, um, you know, geometric family, you know, or, or not, you sort of, you don't need it to occur in that geometric family in order to know that you have the point, but maybe, maybe it does anyway. So I, I find that to be a kind of um, interesting and somewhat ironic question. Yeah, and that's really, I think, where my, that, to me, that feels like the sort of natural question to ask next is to understand, like, really, where are these points coming from? Because like you said, for CM points, they're there mostly for CM reasons, right. right? And so these other points, sort of, how do you explain them? Why are they there? That's really the question that I've been trying to think more about. So it's like, if it's not for a CM reason, then is it something having to do with the, the geometry of the curve itself? Like, how do you actually explain the existence of those points? And they are so weird because it's like, well, they're not explained by sort of any of the natural maps that you would expect them to be explained by. So what is the reason, like, for what reason are they there? Mm -hmm. So agreed, it's an interesting question. And that's, I think that's where my interests are leading me right now is trying to understand the why of these points as much as their existence. I mean, also the fact that, I mean, I, I looked back at the paper, which I, I guess I've seen before certainly, but haven't read in as much detail as I should. I mean, you, you rule out the other 10 CMJ invariants by some other argument. So it's also kind of interesting that, you know, um, a lot of the CM cases get ruled out sort of no problem. And then, and then there's just this extra phenomenon. Anyway, it's interesting. If I could make a comment, the, the discriminant minus 27 CM point was not actually so easy. Um, that was, we know that that point is not isolated as a consequence of a very long Riemann rock computation, which David Gill did. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks. So, so I had a question about the odd, odd degree. Like, does it seem feasible to handle maybe next um, degrees that are like two times an odd number, or do you think some, some? something really different will have to be used to approach those? Um, so when we first completed this one, I had sort of a, a hope that I expressed to Abby of like, maybe you can sort of like twist your way to a two times an odd thing, but I didn't quite see a, a way to make it work because so much of what we get out of assuming odd degree really does come from being able to exploit rational cyclic isogenies. And so without having sort of as complete a classification um, over quadratic fields, I can imagine that it would be a little bit harder. And so we've been trying to look for different ways to approach this problem. And um, I believe Abby and Philip Nyman are working on a related approach or are working on a pro an approach that feels somewhat similar, but still different enough that I don't think that the work that we did here quite generalizes to even degree in the way one might hope. Oh, thank you. Yeah. A, a other... Question. Maybe this is uh, early to ask when there's still so much to do for uh, rational isolated points, but I'm curious if you've thought at all about what if I wanted to ask about uh, isolated J invariants uh, over quadratic fields? Um, I haven't touched that one yet, mostly because it's, it's like, it's sticking in my craw a little bit that we haven't been able to say anything about even degree for rational J invariance. And so I haven't, I haven't given much thought of it, but that does feel like the natural, maybe not next step, but next step after the next step. Yeah. Thanks. So hi, Laurie. Um, I just had one uh, question. Uh, so um, I'm wondering about the, so these uh, isolated points uh, uh, that, that you found uh, in the table here. Uh, uh, do any of them correspond to sporadic points, in fact? Yes, the degree. So this first CMJ invariant, this degree three point is a sporadic point originally found by Philip Nyman. Oh, um, right, and it's, right, yeah, okay. it's degree three yep. over Q. Yep. OK. But the others um, are definitely not. Yeah, these, the CMJ invariants are definitely not because, um, yeah, those aren't. And Jeremy, remind me, I think this one is also, it's isolated, but in a degree where there are infinitely many other points of that same degree. I don't believe this one is isolated. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Isolated, but not static. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, let's thank uh, Laurie again. Thank you.